Marcus, uh, for the second time, needs no introduction. <laughs> the first time I did this, my eyes got screwed up. He's executive vice president of new content development. I was about to say new media, but actually it's the Chronicle uh, website and also the strategic areas of the Chronicle. Executive vice president of content development and editor at large with the newspaper division of the Hearst Corporation. And uh, his name his name is Phil Bronstein, and that's Phil. Phil, thank you for your time. Thanks, Andy. I, I, uh, that was probably an accurate, more as accurate a description as I could probably give you about what I do. But in any case, it's kind of I get to poke around in the corners. Are you having fun? You know, most days it's at least interesting, if not fun. Yeah, I, get, I get the opportunity to um, talk to people who are doing things that sort of outside of the normal scope of journalism, but that may have an application for journalists. And uh, that's, it's, that, it's that intersection that, you know, that interests me and I think ought to interest everybody. And that's why I want to talk to you about the future of media, but I also wanted to say something. You know, a lot of people I talked to in preparation for this said that you're the guy who should have got the Pulitzer. Not a finalist. Wikipedia got it wrong. So it's still well, going on. Wikipedia, you know, uh, even Jimmy Wales would tell you that Wikipedia is not perfect. <laughs> um, but that was a long time ago. I had a great time as a, as a foreign correspondent, ten, almost 10 years. And uh, I was very happy with my experience there and uh, happy I had it. And I, whoever should have gotten what. I don't really care at the moment, <laughs> uh, but thank you. For You're welcome. What's the future of new media? And I know, or media period. I I kind of jumped the gun in a sense, but I really can't think of a better person to talk to from your perspective because you you span journalism and now new media. I'm old. Nah, nah whatever. I've been around a long time. Nah, you're not much older than me, Phil. Come on now. What's the future to you? What's what do you see? What's going on? Well, it's, you know, that's a much more complicated question than it seems. Um, I think that everybody's grasping. There's a little bit of panic going on, sometimes a lot of panic, given the business models that are not, not functioning very well or at all. Uh, and I, but I think, as I told you before you started videoing, um, I've always been a student of insurgency. Mm -hmm. I always liked that. Right. And, and before, when I was a I have to feel that. I, I think I'm the insurgent. I haven't figured that out. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think but I'm, the insurgent's going to shift chairs if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm sit there. Okay, there cool. are a lot of insurgents around. Some of them really, as I said, have nothing to do technically with journalism. Mm -hmm. But they, what they have is they have the ability to plug in what it is they're doing into journalism. And journalists aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily have the time even if they have the interest to figure out how to make that happen. So for instance, you know, Twitter, the phenomenon, we all know about it, we all, many of us use it, but, but Twitter has ways in which they can have a verification process for all this, you know, the giant pipe of information that they get every second and verify it in a way that can then be useful for journalists. So instead of, you know, you're a journalist and you go on Twitter and you see, you know, 50 people are tweeting about an explosion in lower Manhattan, you know, t Twitter has the ability or will have the ability to, you know, geocode those responses to see if those people are all part of the social net same social network, which might indicate it maybe is a hoax or maybe not. They can analyze the words that are used to see if the words are similar or the same, which could help. So there's a process that they can do real time, you know, instantaneously, to analyze this data and then be able to say to journalists on somehow on the other end, okay, here are the out of the 50 things that we just got in the last second, you know, here are two that may seem like they might be legitimate. Like with Iran or Haiti or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, I think Wikipedia has the same ability. It's a, it's a slightly different dynamic. But, so, the idea for us is, you know, let's look at these operations, particularly social media operations, and see, I mean, there are lots of people looking at them from a business standpoint. But, what, what I'm trying to do is look at them, and I'm certainly not alone, at, from the journalistic standpoint. 
how can they help, how can professionals play a role in the future of information, and information gathering and information dissemination. And I think there is certainly a role for professional journalists. So whether newspapers survive as printed products, whether the current structure of newspapers, companies survives, I don't know. You know, that, that's, we'll see. I think, I think that these things tend to have lives far longer than people <laughs> say at the moment. Um, but ultimately, whether it's tomorrow or five years from now, there's going to be a big change. There has already been a huge change. And so the question is, what's the future of the journalism, not what's the future of the newspaper? What is the future of journalism? The future of journalism is that there will always be value in someone filtering information professionally, someone who is good at and is trained at understanding how to look for things that either make sense or in the case, let's say, of investigative journalism, things that don't make sense. You know, it's sort of a nose. You have a nose for that and an instinct for that. And I think that professional journalists have that. So citizen journalism has been a disaster as it's as we've seen it attempted yeah. so far. I've heard that from you or from someone else. I think Craig Newmark said that off camera. Why is that? Well, I, I mean, I think the idea that... Or in so many words, I don't want to say you said it was a disaster. I think, but, you, know. I think you, you, know, you go out on the street and give everybody a flip camera. Yeah. You, you can call them journalists, I suppose. Um, but the idea that there would be this kind of seamless relationship uh, between citizen journalists and journalists just hasn't happened. I'm a blogger, not a journalist. I've never called myself a journalist. That's okay. I mean, people can call themselves whatever they want. But I, I think the idea of, of citizen journalism does not work. On the other hand, you know, there, there are millions of people out there who have a ubiquitous presence. They're everywhere. And they have access to means of recording the events that they're witnessing or the things that they're witnessing. And so if we think of it more in the sense of how can we use that information to, right. to then, you know, as with the, as with the um, Twitter model, filter it, verify it, corroborate it, so that people have more, it has more reliability. Because people, I think, will always look for what's reliable. There was a um, session at Berkeley that uh, Ken Goldberg put on. I remember we were reading that on, on the web, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Jimmy Wales was. And one you of, were there. Yeah, I was there. And yeah. Jimmy Wales was one of the panelists, and he basically talked about, and you know, Wikipedia is a marvel. There's no question about it. But it's also, you know, it's the starting point, reference point. And sometimes it's extraordinarily accurate. Sometimes it's not. And they hope through their process, the wiki process, to make it as accurate as they can. And he talked about this battle that gone on a hundred years before between the Lithuanians and the Poles. And the Lithuanian version of Wikipedia had the Lithuanian side of how things went. The Polish version <laughs> had the Polish side about how things went. And what Jimmy Wells says, well, we've finally been able to, you know, we, we had some English-speaking folks from Wikipedia talk to both sides, and we have, we reached a great compromise. <laughs> a compromise, in my experience, particularly if you look at it in politics, is never equates to fact. So I'm not sure that we get to fact, never mind truth, through compromise. Um, but I do think that all these different social media present us with opportunities, present citizens with opportunities to, to participate and to contribute. You know, you've got everything from CNN iReport, mm -hmm. which is a, kind of a passive experience for the yeah. user, because what they do is that you submit your video and then they either, those folks either decide to use it or not. Right. And your reward is, you know, it shows up if it shows up. And I've talked to them about that. They, that's another story, but... Uh. I'm sure. And then, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, sort of, you have YouTube, which is like anything goes yeah. up. <laughs> if you think it, it goes up. Um, it's not quite like that, but it, but it is pretty much. And so, you know, they're all they're sort of everything in between as to how user-generated content is used. You know, the illusion, however, that I think people in newspapers had when the bottom started falling out of the business was, um, gee, we can do whole sections of our paper 
with user generated content. Right. We right. can do our yeah. entire website with user generated content. It hasn't worked out that way. So I think that, you know that's what I mean by citizen journalism has been so far and has not worked. Is so it possible then to since you got all this stuff coming at you, some of the noise that you're talking about, the picture itself you're giving is that of the journalist and the journalist corporation, the media corporation, perhaps the sort of acting as the reshaper of the information or, or the verifier, but not so much the reshaper because that's a bad connotation. Is Am I right in saying that's, that's in painting that? Is that the idea? Possible? Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think that that's where, that's what professional journalists can do. And that's what a lot of professional journalists do very well. And that seems to be, people still seem to place value and credibility. And so, you know, some people go on the web or go into the digital space and they, they just want their own opinions reaffirmed. Okay? So they, and they know where to go to make that happen. But I think a fair number of people still go looking out there for information that is accurate. So they can make a judgment about it, so they can live their lives, so mm -hmm. they can, you know, have something useful in their heads. And I think that's what professional journalists can do. So, so, you know, you look for what is the pro-am connection? What's the sweet spot where professionals and amateurs can meet up? And one example um, we did a year, year and a half ago was with this guy who is a San Francisco State student who blogged about Muni, about not being able to get a discount. I remember. Right. On his, you know, when he comes from Pac Bell Park, he's supposed to get a discount to go mm -hmm. from uh, Muni to BART. And they wouldn't give it to him. So he blogged about it, which is, that's what a lot of blogs are, you know, people are bitching. Yeah. yeah. And we saw it, and I said, all right, we called him up and said, hey, you know, we're going to call up Muni because we can we sort of have the official stamp of the Chronicle so they'll return our calls and give us a statement. Whereas if you're just a writer, they may not. So we called up Muni and they were aghast and horrified that this guy wasn't getting his discount and they said, well, it's a new program and perhaps the vendors are not familiar. We're going to go out there and make sure that all the vendors know that they have to give these discounts. And Justin True is a good guy. Judson is a good guy former newspaper guy, basically said, the next time this guy goes to a homestand game with the Giants, he will have his discount. So what he did was he took his camera to the next homestand game <laughs> and filmed himself as he went up to the, to the vendor and asked for his discount coupon and was told, we don't give them. And he said, and he even invoked us, you know, the Chronicle, Phil Bronstein said, Talk to Muni, and they no, they wouldn't give it to him. So then we had this wonderful thing, which was video proof that Muni was not doing what its policy said it was supposed to do. And of course, we called Judson back, and they were aghast yet again, and said they were going to go out this time and really <laughs> make sure. And you know, since then, we haven't heard that there's been a problem. So it was a very small example where you had, you know, amateur, I wouldn't even say journalist, citizen. Being the, f the initiating point of the of the story, playing a key role in the story, ongoing role, interacting with the professional journalist for a result one hopes will happen, which is things get better. Sounds like I don't think you saw this. I got thrown out of a cab once. No, I didn't. That was the yeah, and the guy ended up getting fired, and they went yanked this because and Barbara Kelly was the cab person. They had a leering based on that. Yeah, well, was, I, you know, I think it's, yes. I, I mean, I, so I think that we ought to be looking for those kinds of uh, opportunities to just experiment and establish what that relationship should look like, how it works. How do we monetize it, though? <coughs> well, I mean, that is the big question that no one yeah, has, has answered yet, unless you're Google, yeah, or MSN, um, in terms of, you know, news and information. I think I think ultimately you perform a service people are going to be willing to pay for it in some fashion. That's may not be true. I hope it's true ultimately. We I think we are relying on some truth to it. So I think the more value you create, the more likely you will be able to collect on that value. Now, it may be in a different form. You know, the 
desktop screen or the laptop screen may have passed us by already because we made everything free 15 years ago. So are, maybe are pay sites the answer you think, or may, or maybe it's the you know maybe it's the handheld device that you can still yeah. capture, or maybe I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that question is, and I don't think anybody has a definitive answer at the moment. They're all you know everyone's now jumping to the Chronicle's doing embargoed mm -hmm. copy and embargo content. We'll see how that goes. A lot of can you explain to my viewers what that is by? Yeah, so it's uh, stories that are in the Sunday paper. Key stories and columns are being withheld from the gate. Uh, and people are being encouraged to go out and buy the paper copy, whereas they could have gotten it on the gate for free, uh, or get an e-subscription. Hmm. So, you know, there's been, they've seen some action, but hmm. th whether it will work as a strategy, you know, it's going to take a while. And it's only embargoed for a few days, so it appears a few days later on the game. Now, what's going to happen next, I think, with most companies is every every media company is, is investigating or building or instituting some kind of payroll. So all the stuff that it costs us to produce, we would like to pass along those charges like mm -hmm. any business. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, everybody's looking for the right technology to do that, and I think there's a, there's a little trepidation about taking that step. I've got to ask step. you about the, the Newsday, because they got like 35 subscriptions. Well, is that a bad <laughs> example because so much of it is free? I thought about that after I, I took a look at it, because, but I wanted to know what your thoughts about that were. Because it's, it's been tossed around a lot. You know, well, I don't think, look, Time Select was a disaster. The LA Times had to pay wall around some content for a while. That didn't work. You know, the, there are theories that if you just get enough media companies doing it, presumably not colluding illegally, but somehow coordinating, hmm. or at least like a all doing it at the same time, yeah, yeah, that people will have less opportunity and less choices and therefore you know more willing no, to no time out phil's not saying it's going to be a cartel you're just i'm speaking. saying they're going to have okay. to find a way that it's not okay i don't want to put you in trouble no, like, yeah, okay you know, i mean yeah i mean there are you know every conversation like that that goes on is had in the company of a lawyer i'm sure <laughs> um so you know i think that i think that that's going to be an interesting experiment so rupert murdoch for instance has threatened to withhold or to kill Google, not allow Google to use his stuff, the Wall Street Journal and so on. But, you know, I asked somebody from Google once, an executive, if every newspaper in the country suddenly all their things said Google could not have it for free tomorrow, how much revenue would you lose? He said 3%. Right. So... If that. If that. So, yeah. so bend the places like Google to our will. Now, they, you know, they've certainly been more than, they've come, I've come up here at my, uh, to talk to people in the newsroom at the gate. I've been down there. They're certainly talking to other media companies, um, trying to be accommodating in their own way. Yahoo has mm -hmm. a, there's a cons Yahoo consortium of newspapers who works with Yahoo. Um, you know, AOL's pushing big into the content creation sphere at the moment. So I think that everybody's sort of willing to talk and f try and figure something out, but but you know I don't think we have a lot of leverage when it comes to the sort of Rupert Murdoch threats. I have to ask this because why not get you know someone like a Warren Hellman to invest in buying a bunch of the local blogs and you know, having this brand new cons you know brand new uh, conglomerate. I think Warren's already put his money somewhere. That's where I was going. <laughs> What do you think about that? The Bay Area, what is it, the Bay Area? News, news, news Yeah, news, yeah. Um, Where well, the CEO gets 400000 a year or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> the CEOs, you know. Warren, um, Warren's a fascinating, very smart guy. Uh, I've known him a long time, and I like him a lot. Uh, I think that this was something that he thought. Initially, you know, in the Chronicle, there were statements that, the, that Hearst made that the Chronicle might be closed. Hmm. This was during a time of uh, difficult union negotiation. And I think Warren at that point stood up and said, you know, uh, 
maybe we can save it. We being concerned citizens with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it became uh, clear that Hearst was not shutting down, you know, instantly. And so I think that what happened was uh, Warren decided, just decided, in consultation with people, to do his own thing. And he's associated with the grad school at Berkeley, who knows them well, UC Berkeley, and he is uh, very connected to KQED. And at the same time, saw the New York Times wanting to come into the market and maybe uh, farm out their local pages to, to some news organization that they trusted. So he, you know, he's tried to put all this together. And, you know, most recently KQED dropped out as a partner, and I, I don't know how that's going to... Why not partner with the Chronicle? Why the Times? I don't, I, I guess I, I'm one of these adults that don't understand the love for the New York Times. I, that's just me, though. I mean, it, it, it seemed like an opportunity, uh, I'm sure, to him then. There were other people who were sort of bidding for the New York Times interest. Mm. Uh, it just, I think, it was a timing factor. And I also think that, you know, it's a high-end demographic. The New York Times readership is, you know, at 40,000, and the Bay Area's not huge at all, but it's a, it's a very high-end demographic. So if you look at the New York Times, KQED, you know, graduate school, uh, Berkeley. Right. Right. It's all very... Highbrow. Highbrow. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we'll see if it works. I mean, I think the New York Times, it's unclear how that's going to go. They're still doing their own pages, Bay Area pages. As I say, KQED dropped out, so we'll see what... And now you're saying Murdoch's threatening them in New York, or threatens to threaten them. Yeah. Plan something like that. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, Murdoch is the last great press bearer. It doesn't, doesn't mean he's always right. Do you think we'll ever see a day where... Uh, you think we'll ever see a day where all this shakes out? In other words, we've got... It's going to shake out whether we like it or not. <laughs> I mean in a good way, not like, you know, shake out where... Yeah. I think a resolution will be good, and I don't think it... I think it may not be a resolution we'd all like, mm -hmm. but I think just at this point, getting a resolution will be a relief to everyone. Because what concerns me, and I'd like your response, is this free media is so fragmented. You know, saying to a person that works for me now, you can take your one cell phone as an individual media maker it suddenly becomes mass market mm -hmm. consumption depending on what it is and but it concerns me that the Murdochs think that their place in the world is bigger than it actually is and it seems like it's stopping the advancement I'm, if, tell me if I'm wrong I just want to hear your thoughts on it I didn't want to draw it out I don't think that, I, I don't think advancements being stopped by anyone I think that things are happening Momentum is there. No one is really controlling it. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that the things that Murdoch is doing, he's, they're all balloon, trial balloons. You know, he's testing out this, the thesis. He's seeing if people respond to threats. Um, hmm. he, you know, he's been very successful and he's very smart, and I would never count him out. I don't think that. He has, I mean, he's shown a willingness to look at you know, new media, social media, um, and buy some. So, uh, you know, it's it's not inconceivable that Rupert has an answer in there to something somewhere. What do you think of TMZ, by the way? Well, I think TMZ is a, a wonder. I think it's great. Uh, I probably don't spend as much time on it as maybe I should. But I think it's a, I think it's a, an experiment that's worked pretty well, and I don't, unlike a lot of other people, I'm not, uh, I'm not opposed to the idea that we have an obsession with celebrity in this culture. I think we're in a cultural moment, maybe a long one, <laughs> where you know that's really the deal. Reality shows, everybody's a celebrity, and I think it's. To some people, it's tragic. To me, yeah, it's Phil, just, never downplay your celebrity. By the way, I always wanted to tell you that. To me, it's just interesting. It's yeah. like we're in an interesting time, yeah. and like everything else, things will happen and stuff will shift, and it'll turn out in some other place. Um, it's kind of like you have a, a libertine moment in culture, and then the next moment is a little repressed. It's kind of <laughs> yeah. There's a, a reaction, action, and reaction. So I think that uh, things like TMZ, look, as long as you know, people are buying that stuff, and they are by the cartload, 
magazines, TV magazines, websites, uh, great. I mean, I, I think there's always going to be a tension between, in that particular space, between the, you know, the people that they report on, who on the one hand need them and on the other hand hate them, and these, you know, these crews of like wild men and women that go out there to record every moment of somebody's life. Putting the camera right in their face. Yeah, you know. and I think, you know, I think that uh, in some ways, I don't really mean this in a mean way, but I think they all deserve each other. Mm -hmm. They're part of the same, what they like to call these days in or these, this business, part of the jargon, the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of the same ecosystem. Yeah. So if that's what you need to be famous and what you need to be, what you need to be is successful and you think being famous will make you successful, then you know, that's what you got to do. What do you see the Chronicle in five years? I don't think the chron you know the chronicle's not closing down anytime soon. Okay. Oh, that's um, good. And I don't say that because I make the decisions because I don't. That's just my observation and my belief. And I want to make that really clear. Um, and anything I tell you could be completely wrong or change <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> but I think it. But I think the chronicle's going to be around for a while. You know, five years. It sort of depends on how fast other things move. If people adapt. Uh, to and adopt things like the iPad right. in massive numbers, you know, you may see a, a big shift from print readers to device readers, uh, in which case I think newspaper companies would be thrilled not to have a newsprint product. I mean, it's so costly these days. It's prohibitively costly. <laughs> um, so the Chronicle might be some, very well be something entirely different on a different platform and delivered in an entirely different way and look different than it does now and have a different mix of things. Um, but it's still, you know, it's an institution that's been around a very long time. And I still think that people, again, you know, you still, the price keeps going up, but a significant number of people keep paying that higher price. Hmm. So, I mean, there's probably a limit to that, how much you can charge. And people say, you know, can, can the Chronicle be saved? They say, like, how much are you willing to pay for a, for a single copy? Are you willing to pay five bucks? If you're willing to pay five bucks, the Chronicle will go on forever. Yeah. Right, right, but right. If, you're, if yeah. you're not... That's you're, magazine you're, level. Yeah, are you willing to yeah. pay two bucks? You're willing to pay... So, I think it, it, you know, it sort of depends on how fast things move. But, you know, we, we, didn't, we can't see around corners in the real world, and that's a corner. I think that's a fitting way to end. Phil, it's an honor. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks for coming over. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks.